Bibles and turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 16. We'll begin reading in verse 22. And let me bring you up to speed where we are. Uh, Paul and Silas is on a missionary trip. Uh, they're going around preaching the gospel, doing the work of the Lord. And uh, they end up in an area where there's a uh, soothsayer. And they got this woman who's uh, vexed with the devil. Who uh, They made money off of her telling fortunes. And she gets to following Paul and Silas around and gets to proclaiming that they are servants of the Most High God. Well, you would think that would be a blessing, but they, she was doing it in a mocking manner, and everywhere they went she was, and she just kept mocking them, mocking them, mocking them. And uh, after a while, Paul got vexed, and so he cast the demon out of her. you think that'd be wonderful. I don't want any demons running around, do you? Uh, but uh, the fellows who made money off of her didn't appreciate that. And uh, let's begin our reading, verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them in the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loose. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the good singing. Our hearts were blessed. Lord, the choir singing was good. The congregational singing was good. And certainly, Lexi, Aiden, and Colton singing was a blessing. God, I'm thankful for that night you saved me. God, I'm glad that you made it clear when you walked among men that Jesus came seeking to save that which was lost. Lord, you didn't come to establish a kingdom. You came for a cross. And you came to bleed and die that you might save sinners. And God, I'm glad for the night you saved me. Now, Father, I pray that you would bless now. We know that, Lord, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And many times sitting in a service, our flesh uh, doesn't enjoy sitting here. Our minds are geared toward activity. And we have a hard time focusing and listening. And Lord, I pray for the next few minutes you would arrest our attention. I pray for the sweet presence of the Holy Ghost, uh, that, Lord, you would take up your boat in a, in a wonderful and expounding way. And, Father, I pray that you'd bind the powers of hell. And, Lord, just like you did in this uh, context of Scripture, when you cast that demon out of that woman, I pray that, Lord, you'd bind all the powers of hell that the devil could not distract or vex anybody here this morning. And Father, we certainly pray for the saints of God that you would remind them of the night that they were saved. Uh, Lord, you'd remind them of how good you've been to them and what you've done for them uh, through these years. Uh, and God, I pray that they would leave blessed, excited, uh, uh, reminded and revived about being saved. Uh, Father, I pray if there be any in our midst today that, Lord, does not know Thee in the free pardon of sins. Uh, they may be religious. They may be a good moral person. Uh, Lord, they may uh, 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 have a desire to go to heaven. They may believe in God, but they've never been born again 
I pray that today the sweet Holy Ghost would uh, uh, snuggle up close to them, open their eyes to their need of salvation, uh, and I pray that today would be that day when, Lord, they get into the family of God. Uh, now, Father, have your will and way amongst us. I pray that you'd use this unworthy vessel. I pray that, God, uh, you would be high and lifted up around here today. And, God, I pray that you would be glorified by everything that's said and done. Help us now, we pray, for it's in the wonderful and lovely and glorious name, the name of salvation, the name of the Lord Jesus, that we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to several things from this text. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, uh, in verse number 22 and 23, the revilement. Notice what they did to these men of God. Uh, we find in verse 22 that they rent off their clothes and they commanded to beat them. And when they'd laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison. Can I say, uh, 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 my dear friends, uh, uh, those that have done right have not always been treated right. Uh, even in our day and age, it seems like criminals get away with things, uh, uh, but those that strive to do right, live right, get persecuted. Uh, as we sit here this morning, uh, enjoying this church service, as we sit here this morning, uh, where we've got to fellowship with the saints of God, where we've got to enjoy good singing, where we've got to participate in singing, and now where we get to hear a message from the Word of God uh, in the United States of America, not in communist Russia, not in communist China, not in communist North Korea, but in the United States of America, in the state of California, there are churches being fined $5,000 for opening their doors. Uh, uh, they're told they're not allowed to sing if they congregate. Uh, they're told that they have to wear masks, uh, that they can't uh, 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 social, uh, uh, have any social contact with anybody. Uh, uh, they're told how they're to worship. They're told when they're to worship. Uh, they're told when they can't worship. Uh, uh, my dear friends, the First Amendment of the Constitution uh, guarantees us this freedom uh, uh, that we can assemble, uh, that we can worship, uh, that we can praise and adore Almighty God. Uh, but in America, uh, our rights are being stripped away uh, and there are being things done to Christians that we never dreamed would happen. Uh, friend, I'm telling you, if time goes on, and if we don't take serious the election coming up, they're going to put us in jail. My mother's in heaven, but I used to tell her, I'd say, Mom, if time goes on, you're going to have to visit me in prison. Things that the Bible teaches uh, and things that I believe in, uh, I, I will stand on. Uh, and uh, society doesn't like it. Mm. Uh, society says it's okay for men to have relations with men and women to have relations with women and kids are taught in school today it's okay to have two mommies that's not what the Bible says the Bible says marriage is between a man and a woman hmm. matter of fact two men can't have kids and two women can't have kids they need some assistance along the way but you see in society they're uh, 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 trying to ram it down our throat that that's acceptable I just got off an airplane. Coming down the gangplank to get on the plane, there's posters of two men hugging one another. It's everywhere. But the Bible says it's an abomination before God. Can I say the Bible says that there's no murderers going to heaven? Isn't that what the Bible said? God told Jeremiah that before he formed him in the belly, he knew him. We live in a country where they say it's okay to abort babies and murder babies, uh, but don't you murder a dog. Don't you shoot an owl out of a tree. But you can murder a baby and it's okay. That's not what the Bible says. It's wrong. I'm going to say America's got blood on her hands. America's got wickedness in her streets. The Bible says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. The Bible says that, that those that do right will be evil spoken of, and those that do evil will be spoken of as good. Hmm. 
How come it's all right for these politicians to tell us that we got to wear masks everywhere, but then they go to salons that's supposed to be closed and not wear a mask? Yeah. Right. Different set of rules for them. Right. Uh, you know why? Because that mask won't save you. Right. But you know who will? Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's all about control. And if you don't believe that, spend some time with me after service, and that's nowhere. And none of this is in my message, but I've enjoyed it so much telling you about it. They were reviled. They were hated. The multitude rose up against them because they had the audacity to cast a demon out of a woman. They were beaten with many stripes and cast into prison. Notice, if you will, the restraint in verse 24. Who, having received such a charge, the jailer, thrust them in the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. They were not only thrown in a cell, they were put in the inner part of the prison, which is uh, uh, where they keep the worst offenders, and they put their feet in stocks. They had no liberty to even move around. We see they were restrained as much as could be restrained. Can I say some of you today are being restrained? Some of you are restrained by sin. It's got you confined. Some of you are restrained by habits. They control you. Some of you are restrained by your very flesh. It controls you. Some of you are restrained by your ideology. Can I say the worst kind of restraint is religion. There are people who believe because they are religious that they're okay and that religious is binding them and keeping them from where God wants to take them. We see their restraint. We see the revilement. Notice their reaction. You can tell these guys weren't Baptists. Verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Now, if that had been the average Christian today, as soon as they got looked upon, they wouldn't even have to got beaten, Phil. They'd quit. Oh, I, I can't pray in school. I can't pray over my food. You should have seen the looks that Miss Annette and I got praying over our food on this trip. Huh? You can't pray over your food? Huh? Can't go on the job and say, hey, I don't want to hear that language. I'm a Christian. No. These men were beaten. And after they were beaten, they didn't cuss God out. They didn't get bitter against God. They didn't say, God, here I am doing a work for you, and look how you treat me. No, they prayed. Had a good old-fashioned prayer meeting. And God met with them in their prayer, and they started just singing praise unto God. Huh? Sitting there, uh, a, a bloody mess from being beaten with stripes uh, in the inner part of the prison. Uh, I'm not talking about the Boone County Jail. Uh, I'm talking about a prison where the floor is muck and mire, uh, where there are rats running around. They can't even get away from the rats uh, uh, because of the stocks uh, and uh, uh, all the mess and all the pain and all the disease and all the agony. Uh, and they break out in, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Uh, say, what happened? Well, something remarkable happened. It was such sweet to God's ears, he decided to get in on it. Look with me in verse number uh, uh, 26. Bible said, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. God just showed up. He walked in the middle of that thing. That prison couldn't hold God. It all broke up. Uh, the earth quaked uh, under the presence of God. The doors sprang open. Uh, all their stocks fell off. You say, what happened? What an earthquake. No, what a God. Mm. And I want you to notice the response the Bible says in verse 27 and the keeper of the prison waking out of his sleep seeing the prison doors open he drew out a sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled you see unlike today back then 
if somebody was committed under your charge and you didn't take care of the situation, then they came after you, not the prisoners. Hmm? He knew what would have happened to him. The beating that those guys got were nothing compared to what was about ready to happen to him. He said, be better I take my own life than to face what I'm about to face. But then notice, if you will, the reassurance. I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. Verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Now think about that. Does that make any sense, Brother Ray? Not only did Paul and Silas just get beaten and thrown in there, but every other prisoner that's been in there, Man, the door's open, the stocks fall off. Don't you think they're heading home to mama? Hmm? Why didn't they leave? I done told you the answer. The Lord was there. Who wants to leave Him? Who wants to go away from His presence? Didn't you not see up there when they prayed and sang, the Bible said, and all the prisoners heard them, uh, and then all of a sudden God showed up, uh, them boys are saying, hey, I'm not leaving here. Uh, them boys know something I don't know anything about. Uh, and hey, uh, uh, God's uh, walked in here. I don't want to leave where God's at. Uh, now notice, if you will, the request in verse 29. Then he called for light and sprang in and came trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, he'd heard all that praying and singing too. And now he'd realized God was there. Why do you think he came in trembling? Can I say this? Whenever sinners realize they're a sinner and God's presence is around, they quake under conviction too. He realized he needed to get right with God. And he asked the only ones he knew in that place and knew God, what must I do to be saved? Now notice, if you will, their reply. Verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's pretty, that's pretty difficult, isn't it? Notice Brother Josh, he didn't say believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says the devils believe and they fear and tremble. It's not enough to believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people believe that Jesus was a, a great religious leader. There's a lot of people believe that even he was the Son of God. They believe he was born in a manger. They believe the angels sang. They believe in him. But it doesn't say to believe in him. It says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. To believe on him is to recognize he is Lord, and he is the only means for your salvation. Notice he didn't say, get baptized and believe on the Lord. He didn't say that. Notice they didn't say, you learn several steps and you can get there. Notice he didn't say, say a certain prayer and you'll get there. Notice he said, the only thing it takes to get saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. He said, this is so good, even your house gets saved. Hmm? Those around you get saved if you get saved. Hmm? Now notice his repentance. Verse 32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he sat meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. See, repentance is a turning point. He did believe on the Lord. And they expounded the word of God to him. He believed on the Lord. He took them to his house, and then they got baptized. See, you get baptized after you get saved. Hmm? Hmm? I got to thinking about this, and I want to preach to you with just a... A few moments on this thought. Man's greatest need. It's salvation. 
You know what will solve all America's problems today? Salvation. Hmm? You know what will help Black Lives Matter to realize all lives matter? Salvation. You know what will solve all our politician problem? Salvation. You know what will solve all the abortion problem? Salvation. You know what will solve all the doping problem? Salvation. You know what will solve all the drinking problem? Salvation. You know what will solve every problem that mankind ever has? Salvation. That's man's greatest need. Oh, do, does man have needs? Sure. There are some that are hungry that need food. There are some that are naked that need clothing. There are some that are homeless that need homes. There are some that are distraught and need encouragement. There are some uh, 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 that have been cast off and abused. They need a, a healing. There's a lot of folks in a lot of uh, uh, different straits that have a lot of needs. But their greatest need is salvation. Amen. Now let me give you a few things on that. Can I say, first of all, I want you to notice the plan of salvation. Can I say, before there was ever man, there was a plan to save man. This just didn't happen. God's uh, not got the dog by the tail trying to figure things out. He is sovereign. He is in control. He does know everything. He's almighty. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 3. For I delivered unto you, this is Paul speaking, first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. See, everything Jesus did in coming 2,000 years ago was according to the Scriptures. But make no mistake, John lets us know that in the beginning was God, and he, he is God. And can I help you with something? Jesus has always been. He just didn't start 2,000 years ago. He just chose to come through the uh, virgin womb of Mary and put on flesh uh, because in order for us to be like Him, He had to become like us. The Bible says in Revelation 13, verse number 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus was slain in God's mind before God made the world. The plan of salvation was put into effect that when man fell to sin, there had to be a way to save man. And the only way to save man would take the precious blood of God himself to be our propitiation. There was a plan of salvation. God did, just didn't decide one day, well, this is what it's going to be. It's always been that way. Adam and Eve fell to sin the first thing God did is he slew some goats and covered their nakedness with those skins uh, 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 but blood had to be shed and throughout the scriptures blood has always been shed uh, for with uh, uh, out the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins uh, it took a blood sacrifice to save us from our sins but my dear friends not just any blood it took royal righteous redeeming blood and there was a plan of salvation. I want you to notice the person of salvation. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 makes it very clear. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The person of salvation is Jesus Christ. It's not Muhammad. It's not Buddha. It's not Confucius. It's not Mary. It's not the Pope. It's not Paul. It's not Peter. It's not Silas. It's not James. It's not John. It's not Matthew. It's not Mark. It's not Luke. There's only one name that you can call on and get saved under. And his name is Jesus. A name so precious the first time it was ever spoken for mortal ear to hear, an angel had to speak it. His name shall be called Jesus. There's no other name like that. Did you ever notice people don't have any problem with you saying God? AA's got God. Uh, the Hindus got God. They got a thousand of them. Uh, 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 the, 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 all them other Eastern religion or the millions, Shintus and all them, they all, you can say God, huh? Can I say this? Uh, uh, there's 300 different denominations and faiths in America right now. They all say God. Nobody has a problem with you saying God. 
You say Jesus. Yeah. Folks get upset. Hmm? Uh, uh, at every benediction, at every high school graduation, I don't mind you praying. Now, now, matter of fact, you got to write it out so they can read it to make sure that it, they approve it. I'll never forget when they had me pray at my high school graduation. They said, where's your prayer? I said, well, I hadn't said it yet. <laughs> they don't mind you praying to God because anything be your God. But when you pray in Jesus' name, that upsets them. Hmm? Let them get upset. Amen. Let them get mad. Maybe they'll get glad one day. Uh, but if they don't, they're going to be real sad one day when they stand before him. Uh, there is a person of salvation. There's the plan of salvation. Um, but there is a path of salvation. You just don't wake up one day and decide you want to be saved and you're saved. It doesn't happen that way. Hmm? You get saved when God's dealing with you, you'll die and go to hell. There's a pathway to salvation. This man came and asked them what, it, what he must do to be saved. And by the way, must is in the Bible 120 times. He said, what must I do? Very emphatic, what must I do in order to be saved? Hmm? Can I say? He came, and the Bible said, in fear and trembling. His eyes have been opened to the fact that he wasn't saved. That just doesn't happen. Well, what's the path of salvation? Well, you've got to understand what the Scriptures say. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why baptism won't save you. That's a work. That's why giving money to a church or a charity won't save you. That's a work. The only thing that will save you is faith. And faith comes from the Scriptures. And who do you put your faith in? Well, we're about to find out. The Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Pretty plain, huh? So why are people praying to Mary? Why are people praying to other folks? Well, they're praying, but their prayers aren't being heard. Matter of fact, the Bible says that if you pray in Jesus' name, that God will do it. Hmm? Jesus said, I am the way. Nobody else. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you're a sinner, raise your hand. Yeah, we all are. We all fail the grace of God every day. Everybody sinned. We were conceived in sin. In sin did our mother bring us forth. We come out of the womb sinners. Babies are natural liars. They'll be screaming their head off. They got a fresh diaper. They just ate. They burped. Everything's good. What's wrong? They're liars. They want you to think something's wrong, so you pick them up and coddle them. And that coddling never ends. <laughs> Can I say? We're born sinners. But here's where a lot of them get wrong why they want to baptize you as an infant because they say salvation's in the church. Oh, we've just seen a salvation's in a person. They think, well, if, if an infant dies and they're not baptized, then there's no hope for them. Well, you got to understand the Bible said where much is given, much is required. And the Bible makes it very clear that until a child reaches the age where they can discern good or evil, they're not accountable for sin. So a child in the eyes of God is innocent until they reach that age, whatever that age is, where they can discern the difference between right and wrong, good and evil then they are accountable for their sins. Hmm? By the way, if you get baptized and you've not been saved, all you are is a wet sinner. There is a path of salvation. You've got to realize you're a sinner, and you need to be saved from your sin. And the only one who can save you is Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered, to, entered the world and death by sin. Death came because of sin. 
If Adam and Eve would have never sinned, they'd still be here today. But see, they sinned. And then death came. And Kelly just buried a grandpa. Graveyards and funerals are depressing. Because we come face to face and one day our body's going to be in the casket. Because death came. Because sin came. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's why you're going to die. Because you was born in sin. But the Bible goes on to say this in Romans 5 8. Even though we were sinners, born in sin, we have the sentence of death on us, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for good people. He died for sinners. We're all sinners. He died for us all. Even while we were yet sinners, Bob, God commended his love or God imputed his love to us when we were unlovable and sent his son to die for us. You, you got to look at this thing. See, we, we categorize sin. We got big sins, little sins. Murder, that's a big one. Little white lie, not too bad. Hmm? But see, in God's eyes, it's sin. Little white lie is just as heinous as murder. It's all wicked because he's holy. He can't look on any of it or accept any of it. We can be a good moral person and do everything right in our eyes, but be wicked in God's eyes. And while we were yet wicked in God's eyes, He still sent His Son to die for us because He loved us. The Bible says uh, we love Him because He first loved us. The Bible goes on to say in Romans 6.23, I'm talking about the path of salvation. For the wages of sin is death. That's why you die, because of sin. But, I love that conjunction, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're going to die. It's reality. When I was 20, I thought I had a long time. Now I'm staring at 60, you know, I'm thinking, wow, what are you laughing? You're right behind me. Huh? Man, that's coming. You know, I didn't used to read the obituary column. I read it quite often now. <laughs> Do you know how many people die that's younger than me? That's bad. Hmm? Death's coming. From the moment you took your first breath, death got on your trail. Amen. It's just knocking. It's a coming. But the gift of God is you don't have to die in your sin. Amen. If you die in your sin... You're going to a place where you're going to have to pay for your sins. It's a place of eternal damnation. It's a place reserved for the devil and his angels. But you don't have to go there. God's given you a gift. He's given you eternal life. You can dwell with him. Everything that was wrong by sin will be righted, and you can live in his Eden, which is far better than the one Adam and Eve lived in. But the choice is yours. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 8, But what saith it, the word of nigh, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, the, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, here's the key, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. I told you all lives matter. There's no difference with God. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, a lot of people have this problem. They believe here. <clears throat> they believe in God. They believe in the manger. They believe he went to the cross. They believe he rose the, uh, again. That's why we have Easter. They believe all this up here. 
because they've never believed on the Lord and believed in here. They've never opened their heart and believed in their heart because when God saves you, he changes your heart. You're different now. You don't act the way you used to. It's no longer you trying to figure out how to be saved. You are saved. No longer trying to be religious. You are saved. Listen. One of the most religious men in the Bible, John chapter 3, is a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He had the first five books of the Bible committed to memory. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Committed to memory. Lord have mercy, I have to think to get just the five names of the books out, let alone remember any of them verses. He had it all. Religious. <coughs> Tithe of everything he owned. Wore certain clothing. Was always in the synagogue. Came to Jesus by night. He called Jesus Master. He said, we know thou art come from God, because no man doeth the works you do except God be with him. He said, what must I do? What must I do to have eternal life? A religious man. They had the first five books. About, he said, I'm not, I don't have what you got. What a, and Jesus said, ye must be born again. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? He said, you got to be born of the water and of the spirit. When you got birth into this world, you came through the birth canal. You came through the water. And it's a picture of the washing of the water of the word of God. But you got to be born of the spirit. You've got to be born again. And when somebody puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they believe on Him, there's a supernatural thing happens. God does a supernatural operation in your heart and He takes up His abode in your life. I don't have to come to church and meet with God. He goes everywhere I go. Because He lives in me. Because I got born again. Hmm? I got saved by the good grace of God. There is the person of salvation, the path of salvation, the plan of salvation, but there is the personal responsibility of salvation. The Bible says in Romans 14, 12, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. I'm not going to give an account for you, and you're not going to give an account for me, but you are going to give an account of yourself to God. You have a personal responsibility toward God to be born again. If you die and go to hell, it will not be this church's fault. It will not be this preacher's fault. It will not be anybody in this church's fault. It will be your fault because you did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're the only one that can control you. Now let me say this about God. He's a gentleman. He does not force anybody to believe on Him. But He invites everybody to believe on Him. And friend, He invites you today to believe on Him. He loves you. He died for you. And He'll save you if you want to be saved. Can I say this? There's the persistence of salvation. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want to see anybody die and go to hell. He tasted death for everybody. That's why He's long-suffering. That's why he continually deals with people and he puts people in people's lives and he, he brings people to the truth through uh, 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 his servants uh, giving out the gospel and being a light. And he tries uh, uh, to get everybody to see that he is the only way of salvation. Brother Bob, you sat in a Baptist church for years, but he was long-suffering. He just kept dealing with you, kept dealing with you. And that one night you opened up your eyes to the truth and he saved you. Because he's long-suffering. He's persistent. Hmm? Brother Donald, you was religious for a long time. But now you're saved. Because he was persistent. He put, he put your friend Stephen in your life who shared the gospel with you. And what a blessing that God was persistent. Huh? Listen, God's, he's, he's not obligated to give us any chances. I mean, Romans 1 tells us we can see all that he's created. No, there's a God. We're without excuse not to believe on him. But yet, he gives us not only a chance, he gives us many chances to turn to him. He's persistent. I'm glad he's more persistent than I am. Can I say there's a piece of salvation? 
and Second Peter three four says, uh, I'm sorry, Philippians four seven says, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's just something about knowing God and having that peace. Am I concerned about what's going on in this world? Absolutely. But am I worried about it? No, I got peace of God. It's going to be okay. I know where I'm going. It'll be all right. Miss Annette and I was looking at the Grand Canyon this week and all of its majesty, and I'm sitting there trying to wrap my mind around the vastness of God and all God has done and the beauty that God has made in this world. And, and I realized the flood was uh, of Noah's what formed the Grand Canyon, but God allowed all that and he orchestrated all that. And I'm looking at all that beauty. And she'll tell you, it's just peaceful there. And we sat there, I don't know, looked at that thing for a couple of hours. It was just peaceful. She kept saying, look at the calm. Can I say that's what being saved is? In a world full of turmoil, in a world that's chaotic. I mean, the Bible said if the foundations be destroyed what will the righteous do I'll tell you what we'll do we'll just sit back and wait on God because we have peace in this chaotic world because we know who's sitting on the throne and we understand through scripture why this world is chaotic and why it's winding up the devil's pulling out all the stops because he knows his time is short we understand that do we enjoy it no but I got peace it's going to be okay and let me say this lastly. There's the prize of salvation. What do you get in being saved? You get him. Well, I need nothing else. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Hmm? I have a personal relationship with the one who created me and everything else. I get him. I don't need anything else. I got him. Hmm? But that's just not like him because he gives down, pressed down, shaken, bubbling over. He doesn't ever do the bare minimum requirement. I get him. I get happiness. Huh? I get joy unspeakable, full of glory. I'm happy. Huh? And then I get heaven when I die. All because in my little pea brain, I realized one day I needed to be saved just like that Philippian jailer. And I called on the Lord and he saved me. And I've got good news. He's no respecter of person. If he saved me, he can save you. And he wants to save you today. If you're not saved, I, I'd, I'd run this altar and get saved. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We're going to invite you to come. If you come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You can be saved today. You don't have to leave out of here lost. You don't have to leave out of here worried about whether or not you've done the right steps, whether or not you've done everything. You can be saved. That fella got saved, and he cleaned him up. Huh? You know what else happened? A church was established there in Philippi. Hmm? There's an epistle written to them, the Philippians. They went on to be a good church because this Philippian jailer got saved. There's no telling what God will do in your life and your family's life if you get saved. But the most important thing is, and the greatest need you have is to be saved. Do you know you're saved? You say, well, I think I am, but that's not good enough. I wouldn't leave here unless I knew I was saved. You can get saved today. Maybe you're here today and you're saved, but you haven't really appreciated what it is to be saved. Maybe you need to come today and say, Lord, I'm sorry I haven't really appreciated being saved. Tell the Lord, you want to appreciate his salvation and all that he did for you. He died for you. Was buried and rose again for you. If you'd have been the only one got saved, he'd have still went through the torture of the cross so you wouldn't have to die and go to hell. Are you saved today? You can be. We invite you to come. Let's all stand, Brother Ray, get a song of invitation. Brother Ray, why don't you sing that just as I am? Folks are coming and praying. We're going to pray. If you're a sinner, 
Son or friend, you've never been born again. Why don't you come today? Let Jesus save you. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. I'm thankful the plan of salvation is so simple that even a child can be saved. God, to help that one or that many that's here today that aren't saved to realize what they must do to be saved. Be a recipient of your salvation, to be born again, to be birthed into the family of God, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt if today was their last day on earth, heaven would be their home. God, I pray you'd speak to hearts. I pray the sweet Holy Ghost of God wouldn't be grieved or quenched. God, I pray he'd draw sinners unto repentance. I pray for the saints of God and they'd appreciate even closer, more deeply, what their gift of salvation really means to them. God, bless this invitation. Have your will and way. Save that one nearest tell. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.